So I'm going to use this opportunity to start by bragging. Um, I am a firm believer in practicing what I preach. And if any of you need any onions or potatoes, just let me know. Um, this is my crop from this year, uh, not quite urban, but still uh, with biosolids and boy, do I have onions. Um, as you're looking at soil and understanding the importance and vital role of soils, um, also understand, and you've heard this here, that soils in urban areas are very often degraded. Not always, but every city is, you, is in a wonderful position because every city, every day, every one of us um, makes the feedstocks to make soils better. Um, food scraps and feces are what I live by. Um, by feces here, I mean the solids from wastewater treatment. Each of these indirectly or directly come from soil, and each of these can be used as a way to make soil healthy and beautiful again. Um, to start with food scraps, um, in Seattle, I'm very lucky and have been for well over 10 years that our green bin, um, and, and while I was listening, the truck came to my building to pick up the food scraps. Um, we can put green, we can put food scraps and yard waste in a green bin. It gets composted by Lens Enterprises or another private contractor. Um, and these products are available to homeowners and city and parks employees and DOT employees for use in the urban area. Um, if this is not available, the green bin, you can have a community compost system. Here's a picture of Jody Cologne, New York City Botanic Gardens has sponsored a composter training program. And in line with community gardens, you can learn how to compost and compost at a community garden in New York. You can also do this on a home level. Um, municipal biosolids, um, these are the solids from every time you flush. Uh, here's just one example from Washington, DC. Uh, they make a product that is pathogen free, is tested on turf, tested on vegetables, um, and boy, does it work. Um, here is the program manager from DC Biosolids, Chris Piot. Um, and I made the connection to a friend of mine, Esther Stein. Um, she's getting her first delivery of bloom. Um, Either one of these feedstocks, if you take them out of a landfill or take them from being treated as garbage to being treated as a, a wonderful ingredient to enrich your soil, they will make your soil richer. They will also work to sequester carbon. Um, this is a study I did on biosolids. The biosolids focused here was Seattle biosolids, which are used for dryland wheat fertilization and for tree fertilization primarily. If you take them and make them into compost and use them in a city, what's the carbon balance for a dry ton of material here? And turns out if um, you look at a well-tended urban soil, and these do exist, um, with your avid home gardener coming to pick up that compost in their own vehicle, um, you get a very small credit because you get a fertilizer offset because instead of synthetic nitrogen and phosphorus, you're using uh, recycled materials, but you get a relatively small carbon credit and Rich has done a lot of work on this with lawns. These are very rich carbon systems already, very well tended. Um, so here with a well, your best customer is not your best for the climate, but if you look at a lousy soil or a uh, new construction or uh, uh, formerly degraded soil that's being repurposed using a big truck instead of a personal vehicle, all of a sudden that soil carbon gets to be very significant. And you end up getting a compost credit or a carbon credit of about 0.7 tons of CO2 per dry ton of biosolids. And that's pretty impressive. We did the same thing for King County for food scraps. One thing that's very different here is the mass, vast majority of food scraps across the US are still landfilled. And when you take them out of that landfill, you're getting a methane avoidance credit. So for each of these cases, each of these different end uses you get, and, and some of this was from EPA warm, some of this was done using a model we developed for the Canadian government, um, restoration, landscaping, highway use, 
each of these cases, a big quantity of the credit that you get is for methane avoidance from just not throwing this stuff out to begin with. Also a soil carbon credit, also a fertilizer offsite, off, offset credit, all good. The thing that you get besides the carbon is a big increase in soil health. And this will depend on how degraded the soil is. So here are some results that I'm working on from a study we've been doing. Um, how good a response you get is going to depend on how bad your soil is to begin with. So for this study, we had one site at the King County wastewater plant on an area that has alluvial soil deposition from a green river. Alluvial soil de deposition means sediment from rivers that makes the soil rich. Then we had another site at a wastewater plant in Tacoma, and this was fill that had been planted as shrubs. And finally, our last site was at a prison outside of the city um, at the site of a former brick manufacturing plant. But that soil, when it was transformed into a garden for the inmates, incarcerated individuals to use, had gotten plenty of manure application over the years. At this particular um, facility, the food scraps are transformed into a soil amendment by vermicomposting. And so here are the different sites, aerial views, um, all well within a peri-urban corridor. Here's the Tagro site, and here's the Monroe site and the different plots that we used. Um, realize as you're looking at soils in an urban context, there's gonna be a great variety in the quality of soil, how much help that soil needs and how much that soil is able to provide. The Tacoma soil is your worst case. The Monroe soil is potentially one of your better cases. And um, not all soil in urban areas is contaminated. Um, not all soil in urban areas is low quality. So two soils, two types of response here. Um, the Monroe soil started out with high carbon, decent nitrogen, and a very nice bulk density, not a heavy compacted soil at all. Adding the vermicompost, we were able to increase the total C and the total N. A very small, not significant change in the bulk density. This was good soil to begin with. Coma soil, it was a sandy material. Um, not as low carbon as you would expect, but you put that biosols product in it over time and here it had been used for years and years and your total C more than triples. Your nitrogen triples and your bulk density goes down by half. We've used a range of other indices, water infiltration, uh, measures of carbon availability from microbes. Not much change at all in the Monroe, but dramatic changes in the more disturbed soil. And you see that in the types of response. Um, we tested vegetable uptake or vegetable yield, different types of vegetables, broccoli. Everybody knows broccoli is good for you. Um, and here is the broccoli we got from one of the Tacoma biosolids amended plots. And here is what we got from one of the control plots. This is a fertilizer control. This is not um, an ignored without any type of amendment control. And you can see here in the replications, Tagro, Tagro, control, planted at the exact same time. Um, and what a difference. Um, at Monroe, we saw actually the opposite. Uh, the vermicompost at the Monroe, we got less broccoli and just a little bit less kale and a little bit less for many of the other vegetables or the same as a fertilizer. So when you have a good soil, you don't need to put to waste your resources there so much, better to add them to the degraded lot that you wanna turn into an oasis. And you can take those amendments like that vermicompost, we did then a greenhouse study where we added that vermicompost to that Tacoma soil Here's the Tacoma control. Here's that Tacoma with fertilizer. Here is with compost tea, not so good. But then one biosolids compost, another biosolids compost, and finally the vermicompost and kale Caesar as much as you want. In other words, if you have a degraded soil, this is where these amendments will really make a difference. So I'm getting you all back to being on time now. Um, and I'm also bragging about my carrots. 
in addition to my onions and potatoes, how many of you can brag that you've grown multiple 16 inch carrots? My philosophy this year has been grow a carrot, feed a family. Um, when you're using residuals based amendments in soils, you're gonna get carbon benefits. The magnitude of those benefits will depend on the level of degradation of the soil and where those amendments have been before. Getting them out of a landfill will increase the benefits that you get. You'll get water related benefits, nutrient related benefits, and you'll get better food. Um, finally, when you're dealing with urban soils, and this is where I'm not a true blue soil scientist, but um, more practically oriented is um, if you got a lousy soil, don't need to survey it, don't need to this it or that it, put a good six inches of compost on top, do it for a couple of years and enjoy those kale Caesars. And um, happy, I, I've done a lot with contaminated soils and how residuals can impact contaminant bioavailability. Happy to share that information, but that is not um, what I was talking about today. So thanks everybody.